Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome you all to the second international webinar on the AccuBoost technology. And our guest lecturer today, Dr. David Weiser. Uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Dr. Weiser, he's uh, recognized in the U.S. as one of the uh, leading authorities on breast cancer treatment uh, and has rather impressive credentials. He is the director of the Lifespan Cancer Institute, uh, professor and chairman, uh, radiation oncologist in chief at both Rhode Island Hospital and Tufts Medical Center. Uh, as well, he's the editor in chief of the American Journal of Clinical Oncology, President Emeritus of the American Brachytherapy Society, and enjoys a variety of editorial responsibilities. Uh, today, we will join the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Weiser uh, in progress, which will begin with a um, video uh, displaying the AccuBoost technology. Uh, if you're interested, you're, you will be able to skip past this introductory uh, demonstration of the technique uh, to Dr. Weiser's presentation directly. The AccuBoost technology typically is begun with a counseling session between the radiation oncologist and the patient. To evaluate patients uh, uh, based on um, uh, their uh, suitability for AccuBoost, and I'll talk about that in the webinar in terms of the criteria that we use. A patient is brought into the uh, treatment room uh, and is positioned as she would be for a mammogram. Uh, she has the uh, breast placed on the mammographic uh, plates. Uh, there's a, a gentle compression of the breast. We don't need to compress the breast to the same extent that the diagnostic mammogram uh, is done. Uh, we don't want to have pain or discomfort, so it's a very fairly gentle uh, uh, compression. Uh, quick image is taken. Uh, and the uh, digital radiograph uh, is processed. And these images come up rather quickly. And uh, the uh, radiation oncologist then uh, looks at this image, and you'll see on the image, uh, we'll get into this a little bit more in the presentation, a coordinate grid. And that coordinate grid is used to uh, select the position of the applicator, and the radiation oncologist uh, selects the type and shape of the applicator uh, that's to be positioned. Uh, once that is done, uh, the coordinates are given to the uh, therapist uh, who uh, uh, sets the machine up uh, for treatment delivery. And that's what's happening here. And then, as you see, there's a, a wide uh, range of uh, applicator sizes and shapes. And we'll talk about that in the webinar in terms of uh, the, the selection. Uh, these are snapped into place on the uh, uh, compression plates uh, above and below the breast. Um, the applicator tubes are now connected to the uh, HDR unit. The test uh, cables are, are run, and then uh, and then this process is repeated in the uh, orthogonal axis. And uh, again, uh, as most part of my talk today will be on uh, uh, the application of Activus for boost radiation. Um, for a typical boost treatment, we will only treat one axis on any given treatment day, uh, and then the next treatment day we'll treat the other axis. Um, for accelerated partial breast radiation, as I'll talk about, we do uh, both axes on any given treatment day. So again, the process here is repeated. Uh, the targeting grid uh, is evaluated. Uh, the uh, applicator size, shape, and position is selected, and again, the process is repeated here with the applicators being snapped into place. 
And the patients are generally very comfortable uh, during this time period. Uh, um, uh, we ask them to hold position, which uh, they uh, are readily able to do. And as you can see, we do uh, what we can to make the patient as uh, comfortable as possible here for a period of about. Uh, the total irradiation for a boost um, uh, process takes about 17 to 20 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's a relatively efficient uh, uh, process. And then uh, the uh, treatment coordinates, et cetera, uh, all the relevant information is entered into the image file, and that is, uh, that is recorded into the uh, record and verify system. So that's, that is the procedure. Uh, I think that the, the, what I like about that video is I think it very accurately depicts what the daily process is, um, and uh, it, it is a very, very uh, straightforward uh, process. Uh, so uh, my talk today will be the clinical application of AccuBoost with a, with a focus on a boost. I'll touch a little bit upon APPI, but um, uh, my understanding is for most in the audience, uh, the interest in AccuBoost relates mostly to boost application, which uh, really is what AccuBoost was initially developed for. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, the system, as, as I've described, really consists of uh, uh, several uh, pieces, uh, uh, and there's a novel technique for partial breast radiation in that it is non-invasive, uh, consists of breast immobilization, and what I think is particularly special about Acubus is it's using a mammographic image guidance platform, which really is unique uh, in, uh, in, within radiation therapy technologies at least I'm aware of, around uh, breast cancer radiation. Um, it uses a, this highly collimated photon emission using these tungsten applicators, and I'll get into the dosimetry in a second. Again, I think uh, another unique advantage of uh, Acubus, and of course, an iridium-192 source as a brachytherapy technique. Next slide. Um, as uh, shown in the video, uh, the setup is pretty straightforward. Uh, take a mammographic uh, image. Uh, uh, overlaid on that image is a targeting grid. Um, and uh, it, with the mammogram, we can pretty readily see where the post-op changes are in the breast. Uh, often this is made very easy by the placement of surgical clips, but as I'll show in some images later, uh, clips are not always necessary. You can generally see these post-op changes on mammogram quite readily. Uh, and then there are a series of various applicators that can be chosen uh, uh, for uh, the individual size and shape of the lesion. Next slide. Um, treatment delivery, as has been shown, is uh, just placing the applicator in the appropriate position on the compression plate and then uh, the HDR source traverses the applicator to generate this uh, highly collimated uh, photon beam. Next slide. And as mentioned, this process is repeated in uh, uh, orthogonal axis, and the uh, dosimetric uh, properties of activists are contingent upon this cumulative cumulative uh, uh, dose distribution at the uh, center of the breast or at the target center of the breast. Um, uh, resulting in a uh, high dose distribution uh, at target uh, with relatively low dose to surrounding breast and particularly to the skin. Next slide. Next slide. Um, there's some unique aspects of the dosimetry of activists that I don't think are fully appreciated. Uh, I think people uh, often assume that it's a you know, very uniform dose uh, at the target center, um, but in fact, uh, this is brachytherapy, and there's some dose inhomogeneity at target, and I actually find uh, this dose inhomogeneity is uh, advantageous. And as we see the cum cumulative dose cloud um, from uh, the, the two vectors, uh, and we take a cross-section of that dose distribution, we see as we prescribe to the 100% ice dose line in the lower panel uh, on the slide here, um, that there is a uh, rise in the, the dose intensity as we move towards the edges of the applicator, and that um, uh, inhomogeneity to the edges of the applicator can be as high as uh, 30%. Uh, 
And you'll also see that the dose peak actually extends beyond the physical edges of the applicator um, by a few millimeters. Um, and we find this actually very advantageous related to certain clinical circumstances, as I'll show in some slides uh, in a few moments. Next slide. Um, but a key feature of this is that as we look at the 100% isodose uh, shell, and uh, actually higher than the 100%, extending beyond the physical edges of the applicator by about five to seven millimeters. Uh, and we often take advantage of that uh, when we're uh, uh, addressing certain complicated target volumes. Next slide. So uh, through my career, I've, I've uh, always uh, been very focused on what I view as the challenge of uh, the boost in breast cancer radiation, and that is delivering the dose where it's needed, uh, where, uh, at least in the United States, uh, sort of a simplistic thinking around uh, what the target volume is for uh, boost radiation being focused on the surgical excision cavity. Um, but as I think we all realize, that is not always where the residual cancer is in the breast. Uh, and I think uh, clearly it's desirable that we deliver that boost dose uh, to, the, to the tissues at highest risk. Next slide. Um, and when we look historically at how boost radiation has been practiced through most of the world, um, we have had a variety of different uh, localization techniques explored over the years although currently CT-based uh, localization appears to be the dominant technique. Um, but most of us using ONFOS electrons um, uh, to deliver the boost. Next slide. Uh, and I, you know, apart from some of the localization issues associated with CT uh, that I'll get into, uh, just electrons themselves uh, can be a challenge uh, when uh, delivering uh, a boost to radiation to the breast, including uh, the fact that there's a, a what I call the fuzzy edge <coughs> or uncertain penumbra uh, along the edges of an electron beam. And we, as most of us prescribe to the 90% isodose line, that 90% isodose line is bowing inward at depth. Uh, that must be taken into account as we plan um, uh, our uh, PTV, our uh, planning target volume. Next slide. <clears throat> and then coming back to uh, the, uh, the how we plan, what is the image guidance platform for which we plan boost, um, uh, we look at CT scan primarily. But if you ask a breast imaging specialist, <clears throat> what is the worst way to look at the breast? Uh, they'll tell you with CT. Uh, it, it's a very uh, inexact way to define uh, a target tissue with the breast. Next slide. Uh, so as we look at this high resolution uh, fan beam image of uh, the breast, uh, I would ask, where is the tumor bed here? Uh, it gets lost um, in the normal uh, breast parenchyma. Next slide. And it's often a, a significant amount of guesswork uh, in defining, uh, based on this just a CT image, uh, what is the tumor bed uh, uh, that is to be boosted. Next slide. And uh, this uh, study that was done now about 10 years ago, uh, one of my favorite studies uh, from a, a group of my colleagues at uh, Harvard, uh, looked at uh, several cases. These were all expert breast radiation oncologists. <laughs> and they were given a series of cases, and the two examples here, one, the upper panel being the easy case, and the lower panel being the more difficult case. And you'll see these four expert breast radiation oncologists uh, uh, had a tough time agreeing uh, what this target volume was, uh, it, it, whether it was easy or hard. Uh, and I think it underscores the, the challenge that CT scanning uh, presents in accurately defining tumor beds. Next slide. But all of this, uh, I think, has clinical consequence in that the volume of uh, uh, breast being exposed to high dose for boost matters, at least with respect to toxicity. Next slide. And uh, in my experience in the United States is I think radiation oncologists generally accept the uncertainty associated uh, 
uh, with CT-based delineation of target volume, as well as their, their knowledge related to the uh, fuzzy edge penumbra of an electron beam. And they often err on the side of going big with a very large target volume uh, to ensure that uh, all of this inherent error is taken into account. But there's clearly a cost to pay with this. And we've seen this, uh, I think, based both in experience and in clinical randomized trial data. Next slide. That as we uh, escalate the dose to the breast with boost, uh, there's a consequence related to late uh, cosmetic and uh, functional uh, uh, toxicity, uh, typically with uh, breast fibrosis. Next slide. And just an example of this, uh, there's an electron boost patient, uh, the lateral portion of the breast, you see the hyperpigmentation, uh, and I can tell you that there's just a great deal of uh, uh, subcutaneous fibrosis in this patient as well. Next slide. So Acubus really was designed uh, uh, to uh, address multiple issues here. Uh, first and foremost, to look at a much more reliable breast-specific imaging technology for image guidance, and that is not CT scan, but mammography. Uh, and in uh, uh, setting up a patient uh, on a mammographic platform, uh, there are other advantages inherent in that, uh, because the setup inaccuracy is taken away. Uh, breast motion is eliminated, patient motion is eliminated, and respiratory motion is no longer really a factor here. Next slide. And as we look at the dosimetric properties of Acubus versus electrons, and this is in the context of uh, doing three-dimensional planning for both Acubus uh, as compared to electrons. Next slide. Uh, we really saw something quite remarkable, and that is for the same degree of target coverage, uh, exactly the same degree of target coverage, Acuboost resulted in a PTV volume that was a third uh, smaller uh, than that achieved with electrons. So a significantly smaller volume of normal breast tissue being exposed to high dose uh, for the same degree of target coverage with Acuboost. Next slide. Yeah, uh, Dr. Wazer, just uh, a, a note for you. Uh, we received a question uh, related to dose homogeneity. Uh, and I'll just read this uh, question to you. Uh, dose homogeneity is an important predictor of cosmetic outcome in the breast. Has there been long-term data evaluating cosmesis in patients treated using this technique? Uh, dose homogeneity, uh, and it's just repeated. Uh, yes, a uh, great question, and uh, uh, yes, and I'll show some of that data a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Uh, and I agree, dose homogeneity matters, but when we look at small volume uh, boosting techniques with brachytherapy, we're, ac we're actually taking advantage of some dose inhomogeneity as part of the boosting procedure. Uh, I think uh, uh, Acuboost has been very, um, uh, has some advantages in that regard. And, I, and I'll get into that in a little bit more uh, detail later in the talk. Next slide. And a second question, uh, what is the skin dose? I'm also uh, about to show that. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we look uh, to that the specific point, uh, comparing Acubus to electrons, uh, and uh, be, again, because we're using uh, uh, two separate vectors or two separate axes uh, to treat, we're spreading that dose, that entry dose across the skin. The skin dose is actually significantly less with Acubus as compared to electrons, uh, about a third uh, the, of the maximum skin dose uh, with Acuboost uh, as seen with electrons. Uh, and this, as I'll show you in some clinical data, really has uh, had significant consequence uh, in the patients that we've studied. So uh, looking at these dosimetric advantages, uh, we did a, a matched pair comparison of, of a large data cohort looking at electrons versus um, uh, uh, ACBoost or non-invasive image-guided breast brachytherapy. Next slide. And uh, what this uh, analysis showed, that ACBoost uh, significantly reduced uh, uh, grade two toxicity, uh, both acutely and for uh, uh, the subcutaneous uh, late toxicity. So uh, really, this was very much in line uh, with what we predicted from the dosimetric modeling. 
Next slide. Um, but another uh, uh, big advantage uh, that uh, we have found with the use of AccuBoost is uh, uh, being much more selective in how we direct the boost dose to reduce the volume of tissue being exposed to high dose. Next slide. And, uh, you know, it, it, this really is not a, a new concept in breast cancer management. If you actually ask your breast surgeons, uh, they go to great lengths uh, when they excise a tumor specimen to orient and ink the specimen uh, to define where a closer positive margin may be. Uh, and in that orientation, if they find a medial margin that's closer positive and they're looking to do a re-excision, they don't go back and re-excise the entire excision cavity. They just go to that medial portion and excise that. Uh, as a way to minimize the amount of surgical disruption that they do to the breast. Um, next slide. So this concept has been talked about now for some years uh, in various forums, but actually I see has not really penetrated into a common practice in radiation oncology. This is a paper back from 2009 from a group in the Netherlands. Next slide. And they point out that, uh, you know, if we look at a uh, tumor with a 1.5 centimeter rim uh, as being the area at highest risk for uh, containing residual cancer after excision. Next slide. Um, but the uh, typical uh, surgical resection specimen will be have the cancer eccentrically placed, uh, not in the center of the uh, excision uh, specimen but to the edge of the excision specimen, uh, that, that's the circ clinical circumstance we typically uh, encounter. Next slide. But the typical boost volume is being defined by that excision cavity. So we see a very large portion of the breast uh, being exposed to high dose. Next slide. Uh, when the actual volume at risk is quite small. Uh, so it's really, I think, AccuBoost affords the opportunity to better define and better think about what this, what this residual target volume really is, and then use the modality to direct uh, that, uh, that treatment uh, to that limited uh, portion of the breast. Next slide. So uh, we, we now, as a matter of routine, uh, uh, use AccuBoost really to uh, incorporate specimen orientation, identifying margin or margins at risk, and then really directing our boost uh, only at those tissues that we deem uh, to be at significant risk. Next slide. And so here's a, a, an example. This is a case um, where we see uh, the um, uh, clinical target volume uh, being less than one centimeter from the pectoralis fascia, coming down very deep. Uh, next slide. But when we actually look at the uh, excision specimen, uh, the deepest extent of the tumor uh, is defined as being two centimeters away from that uh, uh, specimen edge at the pectoralis fascia. So really, uh, that the pectoralis fascia is not at risk. It's the anterior edge on this specimen that was close at about one millimeter. Next slide. So what we've done is uh, we weight the uh, applicator placement, uh, not posteriorly, but anteriorly. Uh, where we uh, expect uh, the greatest risk of residual disease burden, burden to, to sit. So th uh, this is, uh, uh, again, with AccuBoost, uh, 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 I think a, a great advantage and a great um, uh, uh, application of the tool. Next slide. Uh, and a further advantage with AccuBoost is we can use that specimen information in conjunction with the preoperative mammogram. So we will often have that preoperative mammogram sitting up next to our, uh, our uh, uh, therapy film, our, our image guidance film, that pathologic information all together uh, and really uh, looking at that in, in total and in, in full context as we define where that target dose is going to go. Next slide. 
So I'd like to run through some sample cases just to give you a sense of how we use the technology on a day-to-day -day basis um, and where we see some of the advantages with it. First, when we look at um, uh, eligibility uh, in our breast conservation population, we do see that about 72% of uh, all our, our cases are, are eligible for uh, ACUBUS. And uh, for those reasons, for ineligibility, um, uh, patient discomfort with uh, compression, uh, really quite rare to see that. Um, inability to locate the tumor bed, also quite rare. Uh, very posterior tumor uh, location, rare, and uh, very small uh, breast size uh, can be a challenge at times. Next slide. Our prescription dose with Acuboost, um, and I, what I say is really uh, the dose you would use with Acuboost would be the same as if you're prescribing with electrons, and presumably you choose that dose based on your assessment of the underlying risk uh, for residual disease. Uh, we began our experience using uh, two grade per fraction for boost uh, for five to seven fractions. But we now, um, uh, as we hypofractionate virtually all of our um, uh, breast conservation, whole breast irradiation, we now uh, have migrated to hypofractionating the boost dose as well. And we typically do a 2.67 gray per fraction uh, every uh, three to five fractions, or for three to five fractions. Next slide. So uh, here's an example, a pretty easy case uh, with a nice cluster of uh, defined clips. The surgeon was very kind to us here, defined it very well. Uh, and next slide. Uh, very easy to position the applicator here. Uh, and again, using margin information, we weight this a little bit toward uh, the nipple or real or complex. Next slide. Um, as Annette noted earlier, uh, having clips are nice, but not always necessary. And next slide. And we have found uh, with experience, and not much experience, but uh, uh, we, you know, we, we now have a pretty good eye to identify where post-operative changes are uh, on these uh, image guidance films. Uh, so the clips, uh, advantageous, and you can even see in the right-hand panel, clips define, um, have been left by the surgeon, but you can still see the post-operative change pretty readily, uh, even without the clips. So, uh, clips are not always necessary as we access for targeting. Next slide. Um, where clips are present, but uh, the target is difficult to delineate on CT scan. Next slide. Uh, and there you see uh, in the right breast uh, some clips. Uh, but just a lot of parenchymal um, uh, imaging in the, in the CT scan of the breast, uh, very, very hard to really accurately define where the tumor bed here is based purely on CT scan despite the presence of clips. But we uh, sit this patient up, uh, gently compress her breast, uh, and take an acuboost image. Next slide. And you see the, the uh, target volume really comes together very nicely and uh, uh, very easy to target this uh, uh, quite accurately. Next slide. Uh, poor cardiac anatomy. Uh, next slide. This is a circumstance where uh, you know an electron plan was generated for this patient. Uh, and you see uh, the uh, a significant amount of dose is being delivered to the anterior edge of the heart, and in particular, right where the left anterior descending artery sits. Uh, this is uh, clearly not an ideal circumstance as we do our best to minimize uh, cardiac irradiation. So once again, we sit this patient up and compress her breast. Next slide. Uh, and we're very easy, uh, readily able to target this deep uh, tumor bed location in a large breast uh, with zero uh, additional cardiac irradiation. Next slide. Um, sometimes we run into peculiar chest wall anatomy. Next slide. This is a patient with a pectus excavatum. Uh, this was not a boost case. This was actually, uh, we did a monotherapy with uh, APBI in this case. Uh, you can see uh, if we were to try to approach this with conventional uh, tangential external beam irradiation, uh, the lung volume here would really be uh, quite significant. 
for very deep uh, tumor bed and a large breast. Next slide. Um, in here, uh, large uh, tumor bed, a big breast. Uh, we looked at many tangents for uh, breast uh, coverage and just saw that there was just an enormous amount of normal breast being exposed. Uh, next slide. Uh, on FOS electrons, uh, the biggest electron beam we have here is a 22 MeV, and we weren't able to fully uh, reach the, the full depth of this uh, target volume. Next slide. Combination of electrons and photons, still uh, unsatisfactory uh, coverage, uh, but once again, we sat this patient up, compressed her breast, took an AccuBoost image. Next slide. And the uh, target volume was very clear uh, and very readily uh, treated with uh, Acubus. So this was, was a really uh, uh, great advantage uh, that we see with this technology, uh, particularly for women with large breasts uh, in deeply seated uh, tumor bed locations. Next slide. And this is that patient at the 35 months. Uh, it, it's her right breast that had been treated, and you just see an outstanding uh, cosmetic outcome. Next slide. Uh, one area that I, I have to say uh, I've been so impressed with uh, the results with AccuBoost has been in uh, with patients with periareolar or subareolar uh, tumor beds. Uh, and this is an area that throughout my career uh, I've been very frustrated with the results that we've seen with appositional electrons. And here's a case that was treated with appositional electrons. Uh, and you see uh, a less than optimal cosmetic outcome, uh, some scarring around the nipple with puckering in the nipple. But more importantly, I think from the patient's perspective, um, you know, high dose of radiation to the nipple real or complex is not well tolerated. These patients are symptomatic for forever after that treatment. Uh, the nipple tends to be hypersensitive uh, with uh, scaling and uh, uh, irritation that, that just uh, lasts forever. So uh, this is an area for, for much of my career uh, looking for better ways to, to boost in this very delicate uh, location. So one of the early areas that we looked at with AccuBoost, next slide, was as we flashed the applicator across the surface of the breast, what would be the dosimetric implications of that? We did a lot of modeling with uh, Monte Carlo to uh, convince ourselves that, in fact, a high degree of homogeneity was still maintained uh, as we used it, as we flashed the applicator across the surface. And so we began to apply this clinically. Uh, and this is an example of a subareolar tumor bed. Next slide. Uh, and you can see uh, on this image, there's a periareolar incision, uh, and uh, the tumor sat just below the nipple here. Next slide. Uh, this is the AccuBoost targeting uh, film, <laughs> and you can see the post-op changes just below the nipple. Next slide. And this is this patient uh, 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 five years after treatment. Uh, with um, uh, we, She had a, a very high-risk uh, circumstance, so we gave a very high-dose uh, uh, booster radiation uh, in addition to 50 gray whole breast. And uh, truly, I have never seen a result this good with electrons uh, around the nipple reeler complex. Uh, just extraordinary in terms of the lack of toxicity that we've seen. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I often say that people, um, if there's no other reason to get AccuBoost, it is for these circumstances uh, for subreeler uh, location. Really, the results are just fantastic. Uh, next slide. And uh, when we looked at this, this experience, we, we published uh, 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 numerous uh, uh, papers related to our uh, user uh, database uh, where we have a large uh, user trial uh, underway. And, and we've collected now over 500 uh, patients from uh, uh, both academic and uh, community practices. And uh, <clears throat> one area that stood out for uh, all of the users has been sort of this universal experience um, with um, uh, subarillar tumor locations and really excellent cosmetic outcomes. So uh, th these are the data from the user base uh, showing, uh, next slide, <laughs> that uh, when uh, there is a, a, a skin flash, uh, which is a subarillar location, 
uh, the, the, actually the cosmetic outcome tends to be better uh, than uh, if we're seeing uh, deeper applications of the system. Next slide. And you can keep going there, right? Uh, next uh, example is a deep clip on the chest wall. Next slide. Uh, this is a circumstance I frequently encounter with my surgeons. Uh, they, they tend to take their lumpectomy excisions right down to the pectoralis fascia. <laughs> Even when it's not necessary, they'll go deep. Uh, so we, we'll often see, oops, uh, we can go back one. Um, we often see these clips sitting uh, right down on the pectoralis fascia. I often, uh, when I, some of my junior faculty will see this, they'll say, well, this is not uh, an appropriate ACUBOO circumstance uh, because the, the clips are too deep. You know, we're going to have trouble getting compression at that level. Um, but our experience has been we always uh, um, uh, give it a try, uh, sit them up and compress the breast. Next slide. And more often than not, uh, we see uh, the clips mobilize quite nicely. And it's, a, again, just a terrific way to, uh, uh, to boost at a deep location uh, without having to use a, a very energetic electron beam. Next slide. Um, with a situation with a deep clip that's only partly visualized. Uh, next slide. Uh, here uh, we see a cluster of clips that's um, uh, off to the edge of the, in, of the targeting film. Next slide. Typically what we do in this circumstance is just slightly reorient the gantry and make another attempt at compression and more often than not, these uh, clips jump right into view uh, in the target. It's really quite easy. Next slide. Inframammary fold location, again, another area that I think is very delicate to bring an electron beam in <clears throat> and often results in uh, some uh, uh, less than ideal uh, outcome related to toxicity in this location, <coughs> but um, ACABUS can uh, quite effectively target in this, in the, at this depth. Next slide. In our practice, uh, and I think throughout the, the United States, we're seeing uh, an increasing use in the use of oncoplastic reconstruction as part of lumpectomy. So no longer the simple um, excision cavity, but often these very complicated surgeries <clears throat> and defining uh, the tumor bed after a surgery like this can really be a challenge. Um, and it's something where we've communicated with our surgeons as they do their tumor excision and before they do this uh, reconstruction, to sort of uh, to, to be as precise as possible in defining uh, with surgical clips where the tumor sat. But even when they do that, next slide, <clears throat> we're often left with a situation like this, and you'll see uh, on the left-hand panel sort of the complicated uh, scar uh, left on the breast related to the oncoplastic reconstruction. And in the image, the CT image, you see the scattering of, of clips, uh, no clear uh, post-op changes to guide us as to which clip and where the tumor bed sat, uh, so if we were left to try to electron plan this patient, um, it would be a very large uh, area of breast or, or uh, you know, would it even be feasible to, to do an electron boost in a patient like this. But uh, almost universally, what we find is we sit these patients up again, we compress them, next slide, and the story really comes together very nicely. Uh, and it really, as the surgeons have placed these clips in a way to define that tumor bed with the reconstruction, it is really meant to be done in an upright position, compressed, and you can see this target uh, area quite nicely, uh, and we're able to uh, boost these patients very effectively. So once again, I think in the, this era of oncoplastic reconstruction, and this has really been an area of a lot of concern in the radiation oncology community, how do we boost these patients? I have to tell you, with ACUBOOST, we, we just haven't found that to be a problem. Next slide. And uh, it, uh, when uh, we've looked at the APBI or boost in the setting of um, cosmetic breast augmentation or uh, implant reconstruction, often asked is, can you do ACUBOOST uh, with an implant in place? And here's a patient, <clears throat> this is an APBI case, but she had uh, 
uh, as a cosmetic reconstruction of the, of the breast or a cosmetic augmentation of the breast. Uh, next slide. But we're really uh, we're very, th these cases are very easy to do uh, with compression. Uh, the uh, implant tends to, to move away very nicely, and, and we think it's a terrific way uh, to minimize the amount of breast tissue being irradiated um, uh, in the context of an implant. Next slide. <clears throat> what are the circumstances where we don't think AccuBoost is, is the most appropriate modality? And I think that's an important question, and I want to give a few examples here that I think summarize uh, those circumstances where we just don't think AccuBoost is the best choice. Uh, next slide. And almost exclusively, these relate to um, having uh, the extreme peripheral position uh, in the breast of the tumor bed. Next slide. So here's an example of a, uh, an extreme inframammary uh, 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 fold of the breast. And uh, as a consequence of the surgery, the scar was very tethered, uh, stuck down uh, to the pectoralis fascia. Just a very difficult area to get compression uh, in both axes and to visualize this area. So uh, again, electrons are not ideal, but uh, probably a better choice in this circumstance. Next slide. Uh, here's the extreme upper inner quadrant location in a small breast. It's just really difficult uh, to get compression, and in this circumstance, the uh, uh, scar was again tethered right down to the pectoralis fascia, so it's just very hard to, to get compression. Next slide. Um, sometimes <clears throat> we will look at a case like this uh, and say, gee, this is going to be a tough acubus case. Uh, very large breast, uh, extreme lateral position. Uh, you know, is this a case that would really, uh, you know, how, how, how practical is it to get the compression plates in this location? But, uh, you know, we'll often give it a try and see if, if we can make this work. And, in fact, next slide, um, as we looked at electrons in this patient, uh, less than ideal uh, in terms of defining the volume here. Uh, and next slide. So it turns out, uh, even in that location, uh, Acubus was not a bad choice. We were able to... Uh, achieve reasonable compression and still uh, define the tumor bed quite, quite readily. Next slide. Um, next slide. And once again, there's a small breast, uh, extreme upper outer quadrant location. Um, and uh, it just, it, 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 as you can see from this, it's just going to be very hard to get uh, uh, compression in uh, both axes here. Next slide. Sometimes, uh, even with mammography, you just can't visualize the target. Uh, next slide is a, another case of very large breath. Next slide. This is the Acubus image, and we, we just, there, there were no surgical clips. We could not find um, a, a post-op change that we could reliably image here. But I have to tell you, uh, it was no easier on CT scan trying to define what the tumor bed was based uh, uh, to do electron plan. So just some cases are just just a challenge. Next slide. And small breasts with inframammary scar. Next slide. Uh, once again, relatively small breast, difficult location to get compression. So uh, the periphery of the breast can be a challenge. Next slide. And that's all I have. I'm I'm just going to look over the uh, questions. Um, uh, uh, well, one question I think is a good one. What is the depth of uh, treatment with uh, these applicators? Is there a limit of breast size and thickness can be treated with this technique? Yes, excellent question. Um, the, uh, you, we really need to compress the breast uh, to a separation of a maximum of about eight centimeters. Um, that's readily achievable for the vast majority of patients that we treat. But occasionally, with a very large breast at a difficult location, if you can't compress to eight centimeters, um, uh, th then I, I would suggest that the other techniques uh, should be used. Uh, as to applicator size, um, uh, Ray, uh, just refresh my memory. Is it we have an eight centimeter applicator? Is that correct? 
Yes, for, for round applicators, we have four through eight centimeter diameter. Right, so um, really the target volume uh, is, is limited by the applicator size, and, and uh, uh, but really there's a, a broad array of applicator uh, sizes and shapes. So uh, for, for our entire audience, uh, obviously we've reached the point where Dr. Wazer is able to take questions from you. Um, uh, you can either type them into the chat box or you are welcome to turn your microphone on and ask the question directly if you like. Uh, but uh, in anticipation, uh, we did receive some questions offline. Uh, one, one question we had received uh, related to patient population where breast size tends to be a little smaller uh, and whether or not if, if the target is not central to the breast, uh, what the likelihood is to be able to treat those patients? Well, I think as I showed in some of the examples, I think uh, a very small breast size with a, a peripheral tumor location, um, it, it, those are tough cases for Acubus. And uh, truthfully, I, I, I think electrons are better. That, that, that's a circumstance. I think electrons are better. So if it's... Uh... If it's not right at the periphery for a small breast, uh, you would believe it to be a viable candidate? Uh, most probably, yeah. A again, it depends a little on the clinical circumstance, and, and I have to say it it's also you accumulate some experience and skill with this, as with all techniques, um, where cases in our early days we may not have viewed as being uh, practical to do with access. We now feel pretty comfortable with it. Uh, so uh, there is a learning curve. And th there was a question specifically on skin dose. Uh, would you like to comment on the typical range of skin doses that you're seeing? Well, I, again, uh, with the it depends on the prescription dose that you're using. Um, but the uh, typically the uh, skin dose is uh, about forty percent of the uh, prescription dose. And this is dependent, this is because of you have axis, axis, and it's a cumulative dose at center uh, with uh, uh, the distribution of the dose, uh, the, the entry and exit dose throughout the breast. And the skin sees relatively little dose in that cumul cumulative dose distribution. Okay, and we just received a question. How do you verify the position pre-treatment? Verify the position pre-treatment. Well, you have an image. Uh, so you're seeing the target on the image. Uh, you're applying the applicator uh, to that position. In our early experience, uh, and if we have any question on a given patient, we will repeat the image after treatment just to verify that there's been no patient movement. So, um, it, you know, this is a image guidance, guided procedure, and you see what you treat, and you treat what you see. Very good. Uh, do we have anyone that would like to uh, offer a, any additional questions? Okay, well, um, Dr. Weiser, can't thank you enough for your time and efforts to prepare uh, this presentation. Um, uh, for those of you uh, attending, uh, we have recorded this uh, webinar. It will be available um, in w within uh, one to two days. Uh, uh, for those interested, uh, please reach out to your local rep, uh, and we'll provide them the uh, web address for you to be able to uh, download the link and view the presentation. Uh, and um, Dr. Dim? Yes. I have a question. I just want to know that what is the maximum uh, uh, the tumor grid size that we can accommodate with this AccuBoost? The maximum tumor size? Yeah. Uh, well, again, the maximum applicator size, it's really driven by the maximum applicator size, and the largest applicator size is 8 centimeters. Okay. Uh, now what is the maximum available size? Uh, uh, Ray, I'm going to ask you to answer that one. Uh, it is eight centimeters, is is my understanding. Eight. Yeah, we have 
two shapes of applicators. A standard round applicator, the largest is eight centimeters uh, ID. Uh, I think okay. typically, Dr. Wazer, you recommend a half centimeter margin on top of the. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's a little hard to reduce the very simple guidance, but it really depends on the, the clinical circumstance uh, and what, whether you're doing boost or. Um, uh, uh, partial uh, monotherapy, partial breast radiation in terms of what that margin is. But typically for a boost, um, we're looking at uh, a, um, a, P, a, a, a PTV expansion of one centimeter. Okay. And in any of the situations that we may, need to, we may need to use the multiple applicators? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so, you know, typically you're the shape that you're looking at on one view, on one axis, is different than the shape that you're looking at in the opposite axis. So typically, we will select different applicators for different axes uh, because, once again, you're looking, you're, you're, you're treating what you're seeing on that axis. Um, so, uh, yeah, we typically will mix applicators. And other than this uh, four field technique, like, like uh, lateral and anterior, is there any other uh, size, angulation is possible? There is. Oh, yes. And uh, we'll often do that. Um, uh, it, it, you know, the, you aren't fixed on certain angles related to the, uh, the gantry setting. So, uh, you know, if, if we're concerned about skin dose, we may uh, vary that uh, gantry position on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, no, you're not locked into just the zero degrees and 90 degrees. You, you, any angle that you, that you can see an image is fine. Okay. And what is the approximate time that it takes, the treatment time? Uh, because yeah, it we, varies with the activity that matters. But uh, uh, what is the average time? The average time for boost is 17 minutes. Uh, and uh, you're right, the, the, the actual, what the biggest determinant of that time is the age of your source. Age of the, yeah, absolutely. Suppose if I have the source which is at the, almost in the decayed position, decayed uh, activity, and uh, about to ch change it for uh, a new source, in that time, in uh, in that activity, how much would be the uh, treatment time? For example, in the yeah. HDR, we let's say uh, two to three curie or something like that. Uh, for a two to three curie source, you said? A two, to th two to three curie of iridium source. Yeah, um, I'm, it's probably, I'm, I'm estimating here, probably in the 24 to 25 minute time frame. Okay. So will that, uh, will not be a uh, com discomfort for the patients to have this uh, just compressed for that much long time? Again, we generally haven't found that to be a problem. Uh, and we're not compressing to the point of discomfort. Uh, we ask patients, uh, you know, we, we want to get as much compression as possible, but tell us where it hurts. And if it hurts, we back off. Uh, you do not need to compress to the point of discomfort. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, another question for you, Dr. Wazer. Um, another question for you, Dr. Wazer. Does the patient stay in the same position till the application? Stay in the same position till the Well positioned so times are standard or these grams are and standard or these um, the patient does stay in the same same the position. The, the, same the, same position. Yeah. the, the so process here is very quick. Uh, with, um, uh, with um, uh, you know, we're we're talking about maybe at most five minutes. Maybe at most five minutes. And the uh, the other part of the question is the dwell position the time. Other part the other part of the question is the dwell position time. Standard 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 the well positions and the time, the well positions are fixed by, by the applicator. Uh, so the applicator determines the dwell position. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the time of a radiation is determined by the separation of the applicators. So that is a function of the, the plate compression that you're able to achieve for a given patient. The calculation algorithm is a very simple, straightforward one. It's essentially a read-off table um, that's part of the system that you get. So the calculation is very, very quick. 
um, once we have those parameters, applicator size, position, and plate separation, uh, the calculation is done in, in uh, 30 seconds. So it's, it's, it's a very quick process. Yes, uh, there was a question about the applicator sizes. I, I would just add, uh, there are two styles of applicators. There's round, there's also a rounded D shape. And uh, as to the largest possible field for those, we have one that is six centimeters on one axis by roughly 11 centimeters on the other. Uh, so there's two different shapes to match what you uh, might be trying to target. Okay, um, uh, not hearing uh, any other questions. Uh, Dr. Wazer, again, thank you for your time and energy to prepare this presentation. And again, uh, for all of our attendees, we will make a link available if you'd like to view this again. So thank you all Thanks, uh, for attending. Thank you all. And uh, I just want to add, uh, uh, if you uh, elect to, uh, uh, to get the activist unit, we, we would very much welcome your participation in our ongoing uh, data registry and research collaboration. So uh, if you have ideas uh, or would like to participate in some of our clinical trials, uh, we'd love to have you uh, a, a part of that. So uh, uh, I'm, I look forward to interacting with all of you in the future. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Wazer. And uh, everyone, have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Is that about the same?